everyone. Hey there, welcome to our, you know, we made it 30th day. Um, I've been doing a, an ongoing information to everybody, 30 days, you know, 30 real estate questions. And I wanted to save the most important question for last. And I have some awesome guests joining me. So I have Chris Trapani and Ryan Iwanaga, which are the owners, uh, founders of my company. So thank you guys for joining me. Certainly, thanks for having us. Awesome, happy holidays. We're happy to be here. Yeah, happy new year, everyone. I hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas. So, um, you know, again, everyone's so full of questions right now. You know, we've seen just such an explosion in our, you know, the real estate market across the country, but the Bay Area especially. And I think you guys, the biggest question that you guys are probably seeing also is just so many consumers want to know what we can expect, you know, based on experience and what's going on right now. You know, what are things likely to evolve into? You know, we've had just an explosion in our real estate market, especially here in the East Bay. I think you and you two are more centered in the South Bay. Um, although we have a grasp of the whole, you know, the whole Bay area. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So thanks again for joining us. So let's jump right into some of the questions that I would ask the, for the two of you, you know, some of our clients are asking us just based on what we've seen with, with, with such a growth, what do you, you know, where do we think that the next year or two will lead us as far as Bay area real estate? So we've got a couple of, uh, kind of, a, you know, basic questions and things that we want to talk about. So we'll jump right into it. Yeah, it's great. And uh, yeah, certainly this has been a very dynamic marketplace throughout the entire Bay Area. Yeah. Um, I'm live. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's just been really interesting to see kind of, uh, you know, when the pandemic started, no, no one really knew. It was a much bigger question marks about what was going to happen with the real estate market um, or if we were even going to be able to sell homes. Yeah. And so, as we know, we were, you know, non-essential for the first 30 to 45 days. And, and uh, I had Ryan and I were wondering, gee, you know, what, what comps are going to be used coming out of this? I mean, is, and, and are we going to come out of the gate with prices being 10 or 15% down? So no one could have estimated kind of coming out of that, how home ownership and where people lived, yeah. uh, kind of the, the layout of their home, um, the property type, like how important those things were going to just really rise to the top and so quickly. And so immediately became apparent pretty immediately coming out of that, that when we became essential that uh, people were, you know, not only kind of scrambling to find better accommodations relative to their situation, that they were, mm -hmm. became much more open about the areas in which they'd consider living geographically. And of course, that drove, as everybody knows, the, uh, a lot of people to places like Lake Tahoe and a lot of kind of the secondary markets, I would say, became almost primary. Yeah. You know, what, what also happened you know, coming out of that, you know, if we kind of think, I mean, the Bay Area, I, I don't think many people would disagree, is largely driven by the fact we're the innovation tech capital of the world. Yep. Uh, you know, Silicon Valley is based here. And it's almost like there's these micro markets even within the Bay Area. And so because the concentration of tech companies being, say, if we call Palo Alto the epicenter, for example, mm -hmm. Um, a lot of those tech people would um, choose to reside in a more concentrated fashion right around those tech hubs. And so, of course, you know, that over the last 20 years has driven property values and performance in those specific markets, yeah. more pre predominantly more in those markets, and it's kind of filtered out to everywhere else. Well, what happened, uh, particularly when the, when the um, remote work came into play is people said, well, geez, we don't have to live in Palo Alto. We don't have to live in Menlo Park. We don't have to live in Los Altos or Mountain View. There's a lot of other wonderful areas that we could live as well. So I, the way I see it is basically the concentration of wealth and even let's say from San Francisco out of the cities yeah. because of a lot of the things that happened in the cities during that time, all that wealth basically got spread out over the entire Bay Area. And it's interesting, I was actually looking at some median price increases over the last two years, like Contra Costa actually outperformed Santa Clara County, for example. Well, and there's a reason for that. Like you, like yeah. you said, Chris, so I've been in real estate in this area, you know, 35 years, right? A long, long time. And we've always seen 
an influx of buyers coming to the East Bay from the South Bay and this like, peninsula and like where you, you know, where the, where, you know, the San Jose and the, the greater city, but COVID allowed at a much higher degree people to flood here because now they can work remotely. So I think that was one of our biggest causes of our market growth so fast um, outperforming the rest of the, of the Bay Area because of that. Yeah, and, and two things that I always think about when we're talking about the historical context of where we've been over the last couple of years, <clears throat> truly, really a remarkable kind of um, experience over the last two years, because uh, I think the one thing that we have to keep in mind is that, you know, typically, historically, if you look, as soon as there's any type of, of kind of economic or kind of social political kind of um, uh, kind of you know negative occurrence happening real estate values are the first things to be affected and so you know if you look at two, early 2000s with the dot-com um, failure and then of course we all remember 2008 with the financial crisis right the real estate was hit immediately and I think that really our mindset when shelter in place went in into effect in March of last year was okay how are we going to figure out how to make it through what we assumed was going to be anywhere from three months to six months of just zero activity right yeah. and really the really uh, unexpected thing that happened was this that there was really just maybe, if I recall correctly, maybe a two week time span where we were just trying to figure out what things meant. And then all of a sudden, you know, the market started uh, really becoming active. And, you know, I think the, the other thing that I was thinking about was, you know, what that represented was that for the first time in a really long time, I think this whole notion of with the, with the whole concept of sheltering in place and working mobily, people began to kind of think about lifestyle living as opposed to sort of, um, you know, uh, what serves my, my job best, right? Like, where do I have to be? If I'm going to be commuting to, you know, whatever company I'm working for, what is the most optimal place that I need to be? And typically you're giving up some of that lifestyle kind of that you desire. And what we saw and really what Chris touched on was the fact that our Tahoe markets, the coastal market, markets where it's typically kind of a, a mix of secondary, primary and secondary markets, all of a sudden became these very robust, busy markets, you know, the best in, uh, in historical context. And it's because people all of a sudden had this freedom to kind of finally shop lifestyle and they had the wherewithal to do it. And, and, you know, we'll see if that lasts, you know, with all the storms that have gone on the last week in Tahoe, you know, I'm sure people are being tested about what it means to have the lifestyle, right. And whether that might change minds and you might see it, uh, you know, returning to, more of an urban environment. But those are the two things that I think about that were are really unique over the last couple of years is that in spite of all of the historical, uh, just in context of what's happened historically with real estate as it relates to the economy or whatever kind of social event, um, you know, for whatever reason, uh, real estate became really robust and, and active. And, it took us probably about six or seven months to actually really kind of say, okay, this is really happening, right? Because we were scratching our heads for probably until, you know, August, September, and then it was really happening. And then this year has continued to be incredibly yeah. busy as well. So. Yeah, it's crazy. It's like this year's um, unexpected heat in, the, in, our, in our market across the country. But I think one of the things we're going to talk about um, going over what we expect next year to be is our area is so driven by the tech markets. Like, you know, Chris, you said, it's like if we have clients with Google and Facebook and Zoom and all of them, and the tech companies are thriving. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing that in, in more of the South Bay area. So I think the demand, our demand will likely um, surpass maybe the rest of the country as far as the market staying robust. Um, you know, I don't know how you guys feel. I mean, what do you think? Let's, let's kind of, let's talk a little bit about the points that, that Chris and I right, were right. Like, um, you know, kind of the biggest reasons why um, the market will likely remain robust through 22. Uh, what are you thinking about that? 
Yeah. So, I mean, historically, uh, supply and demand has always driven the real estate market. And so there's kind of like these sort of thresholds in some key metrics that, you know, that I, I would say are kind of the thresholds between, say, a buyer and a seller's market, for example. Yeah. If we, if we look with a historical perspective, the other thing that's really important whenever we're looking at any of these stats, the question should be, what are we comparing this to, right? Yeah. Because something that might look like, let's say low inventory from one year ago, one year ago might've been incredibly low inventory already from seven years ago. And so rather than looking at this in just an increment of a year over year, let's step back and take a look at what, what, is, what does the history look like and what's the significance of the current dynamic? Yeah. And so <laughs> to put a little perspective on supply and demand and the month's supply of inventory to me is one of the key indicators of the type of market that we're in. Mm -hmm. And that means, you know, what percentage of the homes, you know, if let's say if there's 10 homes for sale and only one home a month is selling, well, there's 10 months supply, it's going to take 10 months to sell those 10 homes. That would actually be quite a bit of supply. In fact, that's about right after the financial crisis, we had 11, 12 months supply yep. at the years worth. And, th and that's very um, extraordinarily high. Uh Historically, over, say, 10, 15, 20 years, we all worked in markets with three months, four months, six months supply, which were very balanced markets where buyers and sellers negotiated and yep. came to terms and a lot of happy buyers and sellers. And so comparatively, the last three, four years, we have been functioning in what has been a roughly one month to two month supply condition. And that's in pretty much every county that Sereno and our agents serve, Contra Costa, Alameda, Santa Clara, San Mateo, Santa Cruz. I mean, it kind of goes on and on. So having said all that, where we stand right now in both Contra Costa and Santa Clara, we don't even have a month supply. We're talking 15 to 18 days supply basically means if not one additional new listing came on in the next two weeks, there wouldn't be one house to sell based on the rate of sales. That is unprecedented. Yep. I've never seen that. I've been doing this for 31 years. I've never seen anything like this. Yeah, I, I agree with you. We were running- Have you? <laughs> never. <laughs> uh, we were running the data on our basic market, which Danville, San Ramon, Pleasanton, you know, kind of our, we're East Bay, <clears throat> our basic market, East Bay, which is part of Alameda County, Contra Costa County. But for just an example, normally there's about 150 houses or so, 180 for sale in San Ramon at one given time. Right now there's 18 and six of those aren't even available. They're coming. So like you said, there's absolutely, and this has been like this for months now. It's not, this is not just a seasonal um, issue. This is, this year, you know? Sorry. Right. And so certainly the seasonality, relatively speaking, yeah. is a factor, but this is just a completely different, different condition. And so now we basically take that low supply and then we look at demand. We spoke earlier uh, about the, the nature of the demand mm -hmm. has some added elements. There's some added motivations in the demand mix that weren't there before the pandemic. On top of that, you always have your new wave of buyers and household formation that's starting every year. I mean, people are born and people get married or don't and get jobs. And, you know, I mean, this stuff, life goes on. So there's always the wave of new people that come in that are forming new households. And then there's people coming into the Bay Area to work at tech or wherever they're going to work. So you have all this convergence that's going to organically come on top of this low supply plus these new dynamics. Now, contributing to what's happened in the last couple of years is the fact that, I mean, I would say more than interest rates, that the NASDAQ is the uh, you know, most substantial driver of values in Silicon Valley and the Bay Area. Yeah, for sure. And 
the NASDAQ, I didn't study exactly this morning, but let's just say it's, it's more or less near an all time high. Yeah. Okay. And it's two X pretty sure what it was right before the pandemic started and it dipped for a bit, but then, so here we are two times the value market cap of the technology stocks weighted in there. So that means there's a ton of liquidity um, in stock holdings for all these employees throughout the Bay Area. On top of that, we, we saw what I would say was an overabundance of stimulus. Now, there was definitely some stimulus that was needed and some of that went to businesses and people that were in need. But I would estimate that a majority of that was <laughs> rather unnecessary. And so now what happened is you got trillions of dollars injected into the system, much of which ended up in the savings accounts. So if you look at the savings accounts in the United States, we're probably looking at there's about $2 trillion more in savings now than there was before the pandemic. And the people were given the money when they couldn't spend it because all the mandates, which were understandable. But so anyway, so you have all this firepower of liquidity, savings, stimulus, the stock markets at an all time high against this low supply. So you can kind of take a pencil and a piece of paper out and start to do the formula going into January of 2022. And it's not all that difficult to predict what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, there's just so much in our in our market. A lot of the questions that our clients have is given this big rise, do we foresee any sort of cycle next year? And for all the reasons why you're talking, Chris and Ryan, you guys can give your opinion on that. But you know, we're forecasting a really good, strong, stable market, even if we stabilize when interest rates rise later in the year. Um, I don't know how you two feel, but that's what we're thinking that we're still going to see a good demand, kind of a pent-up demand that hasn't been satisfied. It'll take a long time before that happens, you know, with so much growth in the tech companies. So. Yeah, Chris, I mean, you know, Chris is more the expert on this type of thing, but I, I always kind of, I always gauge or anticipate kind of looking forward based upon what's happening in the now, right? And Chris touched on the, the yeah. typical seasonality of the marketplace and, you know, I think pre-pandemic, you know, typically, and it, it you know, our, the Bay Area market is such a unique market. Um, it 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 always tends to buck, tr uh, you know, traditional real estate kind of um, I, I don't know behavior, I guess, market behavior. Um, but typically, what we would see is, you know, the most the busiest uh, point in the marketplace. It's it's you know everybody talks about it being spring. You get a summertime push, and then towards the third and end of third and the all of fourth quarter, it gets it gets pretty quiet. Um, people tend to focus on family and the holidays, and um, you know the market takes a breath and 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 things settle down. And you know, I know that you know two weeks before Christmas, there's when we're hearing about homes getting, you know, thirty nine offers or twenty five offers, right? And and here we are, which traditionally has been a time where the market is really essentially kind of taking a breath and taking time off. Whenever you hear activity like that happening during the holiday months, um, it's just kind of an indication of what's what's to come. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we, although we've seen maybe a little bit of a pause in the market from time to time during this fourth quarter, when you have activity like that, and it, you know, there's a huge difference between having, you know, 20 offers on a property and say three or four, right? Yeah. The, 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 that 20 just represents the type of built up kind of pressure that's within the marketplace. Now, where will it go? You know, I don't know. I think both Chris and I are pretty optimistic that next, next year is going to be a lot of the same uh, that we've experienced. Um and, and that's really what we kind of are looking at. And, you know, Chris might have a different idea, but that's kind of my, st I'm always sensing that, okay, well, you know, it just, it's just pretty remarkable to have multiple offers going, you know, a week, five days before the holidays. And I'm sure, you know, although we haven't had any kind of formal dialogue with the agents during the holiday weeks, 
I'm sure there were agents that were, you know, writing offers on the 25th of December or the 24th or the 26th, you know, I'm sure you're one of them, Lisa, you were working on a couple offers or whatever. (laughs) I was just going to say, we hit the market last week with two properties um, and we priced them, you know, over anything that had ever sold ever in their neighborhoods, right? Because inventory and demand is so high and inventory so low. We ended up way over asking on both of those with, you know, one of them, eight offers, one of them, 11. So I would tell you that right now, you know, I'm giving every seller the advice, you know, I think we will look back on the activity we're seeing today as unprecedented. This is a great time to take advantage, but a buyer too, because rates are low. And Mm -hmm. as houses come on the market, the first of the year, there's opportunity there. So it's, it's, but no, I'm, I'm with you, Ryan. I think that yeah. this is such a great indicator of next year's market's going to start off robust. It's going to, it'll be, it'll be a good strong market next year, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. And so no one wants to be the buyer to buy at the high and right. no one wants to be forced to sell at the low. I mean, that's like the obvious truth, but a real estate investor, much more my senior kind of shared a profound statement with me, just saying that real estate's the only asset he's known if he's owned it long enough he was guaranteed to make money. And I think that that's particularly true here uh, in the Bay Area. Um, So look, it's never a straight up line of appreciation, right? I mean, if you, you, you'd have to, if you took a 20 year graph from 20, 2000 to 2022, the line is, is going to go up on the appreciation. I mean, it's going to be, if you drew a straight line, it would be up. But now if you really, focused in on it, there'd be some, some dips in there and particularly in 08 and 09 yeah. uh, with the financial crisis. Now it's not going to look like much on a 20 year spectrum because everything just has continued over time. So that gets back to the truth in that statement that real estate, at least as far as we know, is the only investment. If you own it long enough, you've been guaranteed to make money, particularly in the Bay area. Now, I think what people you know, what's in the back of people's minds and maybe some of the first time home buyers now or people that are relatively newer to the um, employment space, <clears throat> but, but in generally people are worried, is there going to be another financial crisis? Right. I mean, let's face it, that, that, was a, that was again an unprecedented direct shot at real estate. It really was a direct hit to um, housing. Yeah. Well, the reasons why are pretty well known, but basically... Uh, uh, credit was extended at mind-boggling scale to people that really couldn't afford to service it. I mean, that's the bottom line. And so, you know, when that unraveled, you had a very flimsy foundation. I mean, you had all these kind of conditions that were built up around that. Another one was like all the new developments and single family home starts were at the peak because all the builders were going to cash in on all these people and people were buying plots of land in Boise, Idaho and thinking they're going to develop, you know, I mean, this, everyone's going crazy. When that thing collapsed, it was like being in an amusement park with everybody trying to run out of that little teeny gate at the same time. The problem is only one person can go through that thing at a time. Not everybody gets to go through. And then the next time the second person goes through, you know, there's a bigger price to pay. And that price kept increasing for, for everyone that was exiting. So Yeah. And don't you think too, um, Chris, it's like um, when the, like like you mentioned, they were giving loans back then to people that couldn't afford. One of the positives of this, of this cycle, of this upcycle that we've experienced is getting a loan has been very difficult. So people are qualified to such a degree. There's so much more equity and more big time robust in the market that we're the next, the next um, cycle of of potential change people have so much equity and they're qualified. So we're not. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So that, yeah. And I was going to go, go there and say, Hey, you know, uh, you know, whatever kind of, you know, economic inflation or rising interest rates or something unexpected, the foundation of the housing market is in complete contrast. The last 10, 12 years since the financial crisis, I mean, we've never seen such difficult qualifying criteria it's in fact the highest credit scores ever, like in the history yeah. of mortgages being given, have been 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 you know uh, uh, shown in the in these last many many years. That's like thousands of homeowners, and then people go, "Well, affordability." That's true. It's very difficult to afford. I mean, we've got our our daughter and her 
future husband or, you know, they're going to be entering the market and affordability is very challenging. Those are real, real issues. But, you know, another question is what's the affordability of the winning bidder on these properties, right? So yeah. if there's 12 offers on your listing or 20 somewhere else, the person who's actually winning that bid is frankly the most well-qualified buyer and borrower that we've ever seen. I mean, those are the people who are actually building the foundation, you know, in those purchases and, and they're going to be able to withstand quite a bit of, you know, changes and interest rates and, yep. and whatever kind of might happen in the short term um, or even in, even in the midterm, you know, if that happens. So I agree with you that, that you know, um, it's not a straight line. <laughs> you know, the market just doesn't go straight up forever and ever and ever. Over time, it's gone up. Yep. So. So we're not trying to paint that picture, but what we're saying is the foundation is completely different. Exactly. I think you're so much stronger. Hey, Francesca, why don't you put that in the next slide up and we'll kind of go over a few more. Um, they have nothing we'll, else to we'll go over a few more. Um, but as far as next year, we're likely to probably see pretty similar to what we've had so far. That's kind of what Chris and Maya and Ryan's, you guys, your advice about the market, you know, super high demand heading into 2022. Um, pent up demand buyers that have just like you said 22 offers there's 21 people that are still searching right they need the they need the houses um and then maybe a stabilization next year kind of after rates go up that's kind of what you guys are thinking maybe maybe a little bit of a leveling out a bit yeah um, and that's we'll cool you know i mean that's welcomed right i yeah, mean this course. is well, sellers might be, you know, really gaining in this market and that's wonderful. And they might want to consider taking advantage of that reality as we know it, but, you know, more balanced market is better because you get a little more inventory, you know, there, there's just, there's more of a uh, less kind of frenetic pace. There's a little level of negotiation that goes on. It's just more, more transactions, which is healthy. Yeah. And there's you know? just, yeah, it's always, it's always, uh, 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 sort of an even market is always better because it provides opportunity for more people, right? And, and yeah. sellers still, I mean, definitely sellers can take, it adva take advantage of this particular marketplace and, and they're definitely benefiting. But, you know, uh, the pace of the market, uh, just kind of the frenetic pace that, like Chris said, that, that always worries me, right? Because it uh, it pushes the market in ways that it puts pressure on the market in ways that to me, uh, you know, it, I, I'm always a fan of a more kind of balanced market where where both sides, you know, have the opportunity to negotiate and there's a little bit more of an even pace to the market. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, and we would always, of course, engage anyone who's watching questions you have, you know, come to us. But I so appreciate you guys taking your time, you know, in the middle of the holiday week to help me. I wanted to answer the questions that everybody's kind of trying to decide is where do we think market's headed? So bottom line is we're headed to probably a very robust 22, you know, lots of the same of what we've been seeing, maybe a little bit of stabilization and, you know, but I so appreciate you guys, your help. And, you know, I would engage anyone to call us if they have questions. Yeah, well, Lisa, I also just want to praise you and the Doyle team just for your advocacy, 100%, 100%. for your clients, for your engagement. I mean, what you, the knowledge you have it cannot be Googled, okay? Thank You've you. got in the moment, day-to-day -day knowledge. You're, you're embedded in the business and the local market and providing this resource to the community and your clients is really invaluable. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your passion. Yeah, thank you so much. I know Greg and I have always wanted to be a resource for anyone, you know, even if you're never moving, it's good to know what's going on. You know, people sure. need to go and kind of watch and learn and, you know, but thank you so much you too. And everybody have a wonderful, happy new year, success and health into 22 and, you know, stay well for sure. Happy 22. All right. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Bye. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.